You're listening to the B2B Revenue Executive Experience, a podcast dedicated to helping executives train their sales and marketing teams to optimize growth. Whether you're looking for techniques and strategies or tools and resources, you've come to the right place. Let's accelerate your growth in three, two, one. Welcome everyone to the B2B Revenue Executive Experience. I am Carlos Noche, and I'm joined by my podcast partner, Lisa Snare. Say hi, Lisa. Hi, everyone. Today, we're talking about sales playbooks and why they are critical to the success of every sales team. And to help us out with this topic today, we have the expert on this, Gerald Zenkel. CEO and co-founder of Kickscale, a company that's dedicated to building the number one hub for playbooks, enabling teams to repeatedly apply know-how from the best. Gerald, thank you so much for joining us today and welcome to the show. Lisa, Carlos, thank you very much for having me and really, really looking forward to this uh, podcast episode today. Likewise. Excellent. All right, Gerald, to get us started, Here's a question that we ask all our guests so that we get to know you a little bit better. What might be something that you're passionate about that those that only know you through business may be surprised to know about you? Good question. Really, really good question. And I think it's also when people know me in business, they mostly think, hey, I'm a hardline leader going out there and and, yeah, going at the forefront at the stage and so on. But when people know me better, it can get also on an emotional deep path. I think that's also something, especially at home, yeah, I I tend to be not like always in that presenting stage mode and so on, yeah. And that's, I think, something only people know when they talk to me more and outside of work, yeah. Besides, Carlos and Lisa, I'm also a passionate skier and that's where I spend my winters on. Awesome. Lovely. Well, you're in a good location for that. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, I'll walk crazy for that. Very much so. So, uh, Gerald, tell us a little bit about your story, like your career, how you ended up where you are today. Absolutely. Um, I started actually as an engineer. So really a long time ago, started as an engineer, went to uh, college for informatics, studied there and was three years an engineer, but then I thought, hey, engineering, I don't know, I like I liked it, yeah. But it was not like the passion I'm really I'm really in. So after these three years, I decided to study economics with a focus on marketing, business, as well as um yeah, strategy. And after that got into digital marketing. So I spent um uh, nearly a year managing a tourism region on all the digital sites. Mostly liked when I was out at the mountains, yeah, doing some social media projects. So skiing and filming at the same time. This was really, really nice. Yeah. But at a certain stage, it was always like, it felt like, hey, I'd like to go a little bit more back into tech. Yeah. And so I was looking for something combining on the one hand side tech and on the other hand side, also sales marketing topics. And a friend of mine, a really, really good friend of mine, the CEO and co-founder of Bitmovin, now 200 plus people, 20 million plus in, in annual recurring revenue, at this time was a very, very small company. Five people, we were always every half a year going for a beer, yeah, updating ourselves. We studied together, yeah. And um, he was telling at the certain stage, hey, they are looking for a sales marketing expert who knows some technical stuff, can sell and market to technical people and has also to understand what the needs of these guys are. And then immediately in my heart, yeah, it was like, hey, that's it. Yeah, My head took probably another two to three months to convince myself joining a startup with less money, yeah, success criteria. Yeah, let's see. I knew that. The, the, my friend, the co-founder, was always a great guy. And I knew when he do, does something, this is going in the right direction. But still, right, it was uncertain. Um, but at the end, luckily, I made the decision joining a really, really early stage B2B SaaS startup. I was the first marketing and sales employee. When I joined, there were seven people, a couple of engineers, the founders, small office, so really like the startup world. And we started to market. We started to sell. 
and then a really, really nice journey started. Yeah. Uh, when I joined, they got the first small investment and then the ride began. Yeah. And actually we doubled our employees every year. We doubled our revenues almost every year. And the last seven years, I was really, really in deep. I would probably say merit yeah, with, <laughs> with this company. Yeah. Um, and I really loved it. Yeah. It was like, the journey we were really like a professional sports team uh everyone knew what to do even sometimes we just didn't know what to do yeah because we did it the first time yeah but it didn't feel like that it felt good um we failed a lot yeah obviously we tried a lot we <laughs> stood up again um, we did some mistakes we did some good things and so on and over this period i really learned the fundamentals of marketing in B2B, of sales in B2B. First, I was really responsible for the whole marketing and, and sales up to 50 people. Then, so 50 people as a whole in the company. And then when we grew, we hired a an, an CRO, Chief Revenue Officer in the United States, where I could also learn a ton from and went into enterprise sales two, for two years and learned there, there to close the big deals and so on. And then the last two to three years, I was leading the global inside sales team um, with all the SDRs, PDRs and account executives closing all the deals which we can close via inside sales and not field sales, which obviously due to COVID became also very, very relevant. And back then, we saw this importance of playbooks. Yeah, we did not know that these things are called playbooks. Yeah, we've just thought... At Y Combinator, for example, really famous incubator in US where Airbnb, Dropbox, and so on were, Bitmovin was there too, and the founders of Bitmovin as well, and we worked very close together. And these guys back then told us just copy from the ones where the processes and the sales already works. Copy them and you will be successful. And that they were right. Yeah. So, and they challenged us on a lot of things, and we looked into certain companies like Algolia, how they do their sales, checked in with them. But I still find it so hard to get know-how from the best and apply this know-how to a certain stage in your life, in your career or in your company. And that's where my co-founder Marcus and myself had the idea to build up something like Kickscape. And besides Bitmovin, we already started to consult several other successful startups. And we saw that every one of these companies had the same problem. And I had it too. Yeah, I, I failed in a lot of things. Onboarding new sales employees was a challenge. Um, training them was a challenge. We had less resources, no sales enablement department. And out of that, we founded Kickscale. And that's where we are here. And really, really nice now talking with you a little bit more about these topics. and helping other sales leaders with the right know-how to be successful because I didn't have the access to these predefined playbooks to make my team successful. And that's really where I yeah, learned so much to help my team even better. That's amazing. That's a great story, Gerald. And when you are talking about the playbooks that uh, I love how you said the the people tell you to just copy what the successful sales organizations do. So part of Kickscale is it sounds like templates for playbooks. Do you also build them completely customized depending on your client? So yes, both we have in our offering. Yeah, when you like want to have some playbooks, you go in in the platform, sign up, and get the templates. Yeah, like how to build the ideal customer profile, how to do the value framework, and so on. And yes, we also help our customers, especially on the enterprise side, with building the playbooks that they fit towards their needs. Typically, we use also our templates. Yeah, and customize then the pieces on that. That's great. And you had mentioned uh, you yourself learning uh, sales and marketing. And one of the topics we had on our list today was actually to discuss how you balance the focus between both to create an ideal outcome for your companies. Yeah, that's a very, very good question. Um, I believe that sales and marketing gets closer and closer all the time. So it's more like revenue function instead of sales and marketing. Yeah? 
Um, both departments need each other. I saw it also with my previous engagements with the jobs, with the uh, companies we work together. It's different people, it's different skill sets. Yeah, you have the marketers producing leads, doing really, really creative stuff, really nice campaigns. So on the other hand side, you have sellers, yeah, really building up the relationship, helping other people in that sense, probably not the most structured people yeah, from a sales side. And sometimes there is definitely conflict potential. And balancing out, I totally believe it has to be a common goal. Yeah, a common goal for both departments um, that they go towards a really, really yeah, common goal. And is that how you've created um, the, the cohesive environment at Kickscale? Do you start with that common goal? Yes. So obviously we look into that and say our goal is focused on the customers. So how can we enable customers with playbooks and everything on content, for example, we also put out, we focus on how can we enable SDRs, BDRs um, with, this, with playbooks. We built, for example, an SDR network, BDR network, where leading SDRs and BDRs from Salesforce, Zendesk, Zoom, and so on are part of, and we send them every two weeks valuable content. It's completely for free yeah, because we want to support them. And that's owned right now on the marketing function. So marketing is fully bought in also what tactics work for the salespeople and so on. And on the other hand side, sales and customer success engaging here as well and building the relationships on top of the content, for example, we already sent out. So yes, that's one really, really important topic. Excellent. So, um, you know, play books can be a very general statement. So when you say you have some templates, can you share with us um, what, what some of those templates are? Like, so what might be some of the predefined ones that you all have that your customers value and say, hey, these are some of the best? Oh, you're on mute for some reason. Please, can you hear him? Yeah, oh, there you go, you're back. Totally, yes. So when you look into that, you have several categories of playbooks. And we cluster them first into process playbooks, like to define all the processes necessary in a revenue organization. This is mostly the documentation of existing processes, but also finding out new ways to do certain things. Then we have training material, which is the training playbooks, like how to do great sales meetings how to do cold calling, how to do outbound sales, how to onboard new salespeople, and so on and so forth. And then we have further playbooks, which we call resources. And this might be a cold calling script. This might be certain email templates. This might be how to define the ideal customer profile. So overall, I would cluster it in these three main categories. And then below that, there are certain types of playbooks, like as mentioned, and we see it really from the whole life cycle of a sell life cycle yeah, of a seller. When they come in, they need some great onboard. The sales leader typically don't have the time to onboard them in a structured way, especially when you are a B2B growing startup and growing company. And then you start with playbooks. You get them to a further stage where you learn how to do meetings how to do cold calls and so on. It's definitely something what we see also for junior sellers coming in into roles newly. Yeah, probably have never done before sales, has done some experience in sales, but don't, don't have all the skills they need. And that's where these playbooks really come into the game. And instead of booking a coach, for example, where you need certain different coaches, you got into Kickscale and get the playbooks also from different coaches and you can roll that out easily to your team. Excellent. So it was process, training, and resources. Did I get that right? Yes, that's really the three main topics. What we see there, what is also defined by other leading companies in exactly that, that direction. And uh, who should, within your customers' organizations, who should own these playbooks and kind of maintaining them and keeping going from your perspective? And I'm sure it might vary. 
Definitely. It really, Carlos, it really depends on the company size itself. So when you look at really large or bigger scale organizations, they have typically sales enablement um, experts and they take, they take care of all of the creation of these playbooks and rolling out the training plans and so on and so forth. For companies like small and medium businesses, where we also mostly work together with like 50 to 500-ish people, you don't have always sales enablement experts. So that means the sales leader, the marketing leader, sometimes even the founders, the C-level, sometimes some individual sellers, they have to do some videos, they have to do some materials, some resources, some templates, and then it gets tricky because you have to balance out the normal work, like the normal sales work. And on the other hand side, you should document what works. You should build these playbooks. And that's why templates are so nice because you can use them. And 80% of the content is fine and you only have to tweak like if you want, yeah? The last 20% towards your needs and a full onboarding program, a full training program is ready to go. And so you hit the ground running very, very fast. Yeah. Um, you know, earlier we we're talking about sales and marketing in, in my kind of our view, it's kind of thing is, you know, marketing looks a lot of the world as a one to many. In other words, they're creating messaging to impact many folks across many channels. At best, you know, we can narrow it down to a title and in industry sometimes. Sales and again, I'm just generalizing a lot of times is one on one. We're trying to have a one on one conversation with an individual to understand them, their role, their business, their wants and desires. And um, because these two different perspectives, it's sometimes hard to get the organization to kind of come together. And it, how do you folks deal with that complexity and, and the marketing side of it? Any advice there? Really, really good question. And I think a very valuable question, yeah, to be honest. Um, I think it depends from case to case how big your customers are, the ideal customer profile you are targeting. Um, if you are targeting really huge enterprise B2B companies, yeah, marketing is mostly on a supporting role, like through the whole customer lifecycle or the whole prospect lifecycle. And sales still goes in with the with the one on ones on that side. That's what we saw, for example, works pretty nicely when going into enterprises, having like marketing really supporting us on major events, yeah, making the communication work, sending out the newsletter, and then sales still going into the one on one topics, yeah. So along those lines, uh, do, should the sales so that should the playbooks help support their sales process or sales behaviors? How, how do you create that alignment? Uh, that's a really good thing. Yeah. Why? Sometimes we see, and I was also part of that. Yeah. Sales execution. I compare it mostly with sports. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you are not training frequently, please don't come to the match. Yeah. In yeah. that sense. And you're out of the game. That's on the one hand side and having the discipline in, in doing that. Yeah. And I think the really interesting part is most people, most sellers know how to do it. They mostly also know what to do, but it takes like always this little tweaking and always this new thinking and remind us as well to get, get on with it. And that's, I think, how how I see it. I really compare it with sports. Yeah, mm -hmm. my hint is on that. What I, to be honest with you, completely ignored at the very beginning, especially. Yeah, I said, "Hey, sales. Yeah, let's talk here. Let's talk there. Let's chat with this person, with this person. Even in huge organizations, no structure in nothing. Yeah, more or less. And I think first of all, discipline. Yeah." and structure to do the same things over and over again. I think it's really comparable with sports. If you want to become a really professional runner, go out, run five times. And that's how I see sales also. I didn't do it at the very beginning. I thought sales, yeah, you know, you talk with a lot of people, you have some fun and so on. And it works as well. Don't get me wrong. I, there are ways where it works. 
But if you want to get it done as a team and have a framework, then you need this framework of rules, playbooks in place and roll that out also frequently and check it also in frequently with the team that everyone understands the same thing, like a really good football coaches do. Yeah, I, I agree with you very much. In fact, I, I, I remind folks, you know, the best teams and the best players are usually the ones that practice and put the most effort into the game. And totally, he, 100%. Yeah, you know, I mean, sometimes you think, well, hey, he's the best at that. So, you know, he should practice less. The reality is they practice it more than anyone else, right? Because they want to stay the best and keep that level of skill set. It's a game of inches sometimes, and that difference comes into it. Now, um, so a lot of times we work with organizations, you know, Carlos, we need specific playbooks, like a persona, a title that we're selling to, maybe even by industry, because it may differ in finance versus manufacturing. And then, you know, they kind of want to have like, hey, I don't want a script, but I do kind of want to, can I get a set of questions that really help us uncover and position our differentiators? Do you all get involved in that those aspects of those really kind of customized specific playbooks that are to an organization and their products and who they're selling to? So mostly we provide the templates that organizations customize it their own. Yeah, we are here to support. But mostly we provide the templates first and then a smart seller customizes there a little bit and then they roll it out to the whole team. Yeah. So that's what we see and where we are already 80% on the way. Typically, especially when you look into fast growing companies, you hire people yeah, and you don't get always the best players. Yeah. So you the, the challenge, what, what we see out there is not, like you said, Carlos, I liked it very much. The best players are the best players because they know already how to train. They know already what to do and they do it also. They train harder than anyone else. Yeah. But this is probably if you're a really great sales team, 40, 50% of your whole sales force, and then you're already a great sales team, I think. In reality, it's probably one third of your sales organization where you just don't have to do anything with them. They just get out, they train, they close, they do. But the other two thirds, yeah, as a sales organization, you want to help them. And you want to help them, everyone individually, with meeting playbook, cold calling playbook, where their strengths are to supporting even their strengths, but probably also to get some of their weaknesses out, which you have to get out. Yeah. Yep. If someone cannot do pitches as a seller, probably it's the wrong person. Yeah. And not a seller. But if they are really, if, if we see the potential, to grow them towards the seller, they need the right playbooks to get to that level. That's how I see that. Yeah, and can I, kind of continuing that sports analogy, what I've also noticed is um, some of you with the best talent and to put the most effort in, it isn't like you can just set them free and go, hey, go do your stuff. Because those folks are also the ones that are constantly looking for coaching and how do I get better, right? Um, you look at golf, you know, they're always hiring a different golf coach, not because this person plays golf better than they do, but because they're able to identify their weaknesses and coach them through getting better. And I, I think the best salespeople, individuals and organizations are looking for that and they'll stay longer if they get it. And if they yes. don't, they'll usually move on, right? Because they've yeah, peaked exactly. right where they're at. And I didn't mean to digress. Hey, one last question, yeah. since you have some of this... Do you focus on certain industries? Is there certain industries you go, hey, we have some content and it applies to certain industries versus others? Yes, right now when you look at it, it's really B2B software as a service in a way, a complex sales. Yeah, in When you look at it, deal sizes between 50-ish to a 200, 300K per year yeah, in annual recurring, that's where our sweet spot lies. Why? Um, we see it in that way if you are going out and selling a non-complex product like a fitness subscription and so on yeah it's a different approach than when you sell a video streaming service yeah or a infrastructure for hosting videos and so on and so forth so it's really the technical sense technical products b2b SaaS. makes sense i'm curious just to revisit a topic that you touched on uh, a minute ago do you have a playbook 
for managers to coach to their playbooks effectively? Really, really good question, Lisa. <laughs> and not yet, but I take that as a note that we get that in as soon as possible. Yeah, because that's actually what we want to make. Yeah, we want that the platform takes a lot of efforts from the sales leaders, but sure, the sales right. leaders should still focus on helping their team in individual one-on-ones and so on, where they can bring the most value up. Well, I just also, and you've probably seen this in your career as well, is like there's times when you put in a lot of effort to make sure that these resources exist. And after onboarding, they're basically abandoned. So unless you place them in front of your team frequently or at regular intervals, that resource is just there for onboarding new employees. And it's not something that you go back to very often. So I was just thinking as you two were, were having that conversation, if you could help managers to understand this almost like course correcting back to the best practices that are outlined in your playbooks, that needs to happen. That needs to happen frequently. I know as a manager myself, I was every quarter almost taking my team back to this is good CRM hygiene. This is how we do research. This is how we personalize our messaging and making sure that those good habits continue. Um, otherwise, then your playbooks and their investment with Kickscale, just it's like getting dusty in a cupboard. <laughs> Somewhere. Yes. Lisa, how do, do you know? I mean, you, you spoke about it. You know it exactly, right? That as a sales leader, ideally, you don't want to repeat yourself over and over again with the same topics. But we do. I did as well. It's, it's just normal. And you find yourself, whatever, at the mid of the quarter, at the end of the quarter. Oh, guys, the Salesforce hygiene is just... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you find yourself, yeah? And... The bad thing is I did that as well. I reminded myself all the time. Yeah, I said, hey, let's jump on another meeting and so on and so forth. And I think it's still necessary to have some discipline on that Yeah, and to get on a meeting probably. But I don't want to repeat the informational stuff on it. And that's where the playbooks come in. So say, hey, guys, I've rolled out the playbook about Salesforce hygiene. Watch it. The system is checking everything. Yeah. And then for sure, I can check in on a quick chat. Say, hey, guys. Who has not done it? Why adopting it? And the system, and that's also in which direction we are going, the system takes care of it. And with integrations into different systems, you also check who closed what, what's the hygiene and so on, and recommend certain playbooks for certain sellers so that you don't have to take care as a sales leader about everything. Oh, that's really interesting. So when, so just to put that idea into play, so when a opportunity is at a certain stage or if a field has a certain amount of data or a certain kind of data in it, would it prompt you to go to a playbook? Is that For what example, you're yeah. Imagine like you are now close before closing a deal. You know, in, in contract negotiation, whatever, if you have the stage in your pipeline contract negotiation. And then obviously in the system, there could be triggered depending on the close rate of this certain seller, whatever it is, yeah, a playbook for, hey, this is how you negotiate. This is how you navigate through the legal departments, through the procurement departments and so on. Because as you know, people forget about things. I, I forget so many things. I learned a ton, yeah, over seven years in a B2B SaaS startup and, and helping other startups to grow. But I forget it because what you don't use, you just forget. Yeah, And that's why you need these playbooks to remind people about it because you can train them easily. You can remind it. And sometimes a 30 second, one minute reminder video is already enough they need to move the needle. I love that. That's amazing. Well, uh, shifting direction a little bit here, you are a CEO, you're a co-founder, um, and you get prospected too, I'm sure, daily, <laughs> if not weekly. So curious to know when something actually captures your attention and might even make you respond from someone who has no relationship with you, like a cold prospecting message, 
what uh, what catches your attention? What do they need to do to earn your time? Yes, um, thank you, Lisa. Yeah, um, first of all, I try to be always nice. I was not always nice in the past. It, it's really like that. Sometimes I picked up someone caught me in the middle of something. I was I was not nice. Yeah, so I'm nice now. At least I try always to be nice. Yeah. <laughs> And that's my first hint to everyone. Yeah, there are people on the other hand side, mostly junior sellers who get a list of whatever, 100 numbers calling there and they call and some people pick up and whatever. Yeah, so um, that's first. Second, what caught my attention? I just had the cold call, I think, yesterday. And people call me and then they pitch something and so on and so forth. And typically it's like, it's not, nothing is in there which caught my attention, yeah. But this person, for example, yesterday shifted so nice. Hey, and I saw on your website, right, you offer the fast and convenient sales onboarding and training platform. Um, I think this might be for X and Y company relevant too, right? And immediately, he obviously had my attention, yeah. Not for his or her product in that case, yeah, but... We exchanged, we connected on LinkedIn, yeah, we are connected here. It was, in my opinion, a really great call because I like this person, yeah, he, he did some research and so on, and probably not even too much research, yeah. So mm -hmm. my first hint is you need to do some research. I'm not saying you should spend, I mean, if you call the CEO of a Fortune 500 company and you can reach uh, him or at least the assistant, yeah, probably do a lot of research, but a little bit of research, that's a little bit personalization, a little bit of research that I'm not feeling like I'm the 20th person in the list calling me, hey, am I speaking to Gerald? Yeah, Gerald, we are X, Y, and Z and offering that and that. Oh, great, yeah. But like, hey, Gerald, I saw there was a Forbes article going out today of you. Congratulations on that. And then just pausing, right? Because then, okay, yeah, and how can I help you? That's what I would recommend everyone doing cold calling, focusing on that, on the personalization part. But on the other hand, said also not wasting the time on personalization. Why? Statistics show you get the connection rate out of 100 calls, you get probably two to three leads if you are already successful. So if you spend like five minutes for researching every lead, yeah, the day is almost gone, I would say. Yeah. So... Right. You have to balance that out, yeah. Um, still having a lot of volume in there, but having some personalization, probably having that open on the site, the website, whatever, to just get out some buzzwords to get over this first um, barrier, I would say. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, it's it's true. We've got to personalize at scale as much as we can. Um, the research is important, um, but it's also it's a balance. Yes. And Lisa, one thing and Carlos to add, the persistence as well. Yeah. I I see so many people calling or emailing one time. And mm. this is nice. And we obviously I did that as well. So everything I talk is pure <laughs> mistakes we did as well and not followed up and so on and so forth. Mm. Yeah. But not following up costs you revenue. And especially for cold calls. I had once I think a person calling me three times in a row. And you have to find the balance between annoying and obviously persistence. Yeah, that's that's absolutely yeah. right. But I pick I, I picked it up because I thought if someone is calling me three times, it's important. And this, Gerald, luckily you picked up. Thank you so much. <laughs> and obviously, can you hang up after such a warm welcome? No, you. I mean, I can't. <laughs> yeah. And this worked out, and I connected this person back then to one of our um, sales enablement managers, and they had a good chat. And. That's what I want to add as well here. That's uh, and and that's really important. And it's I've got this question for you because it sounds like you've you've managed both teams, and it's an interesting stat that sixty percent of sales reps don't do any outbound. What is the balance? Do you believe between getting leads from inbound versus how much you need to do outbound? Yeah, that's. Um... So we had tons of discussions about that and also hard discussions. Why? We got flooded with leads. We got so many leads in, which was great. Yeah. But we had no objective measures to measure the quality on the right way. And so 
the marketing team was frustrated at a certain stage because they were producing so many leads and everyone was saying, hey, leads everywhere, right? Mm -hmm. And the sales team got frustrated too because there were so many leads, but they were saying, hey, these leads did not go anywhere. And marketing says, yeah, but then tell us what to do. So first of all, be before thinking of the, the ratio of inbound and outbound, I would really clearly define I know it's not always possible for us. We had also to experiment a lot. This is part of the process, building it up. But making some experiments, hypotheses, and then measuring on that. Yeah. So um, I think when you go for outbound, you as a seller or the sales team can 100% focus on where they want to go in and why. Mm -hmm. And this is a really, really nice option. Yeah. Because you can select, hey, I see... Turner yeah, offers great video services. Why not approaching them for a video player, for video infrastructure, whatever? Who would be the right person? I can prospect that myself. And with the right messaging, with the right tactic, I can get to someone and book a meeting. And I know the sales team from a very first, hey, this works. It's more effort, obviously. It's cold. It's more effort. It takes, in my opinion, more educated salespeople, a different skill set. On inbound, on the other hand side, when you get leads in, and especially if you get the right leads in, it's it can skyrocket. If you have this machine, it gets in. We know we get all VP of sales, head of sales in because we do such a great webinar or whatever, and we get that in checkpot, in my opinion. Um, at the very first, when people when companies are small, I think you need to that people do mostly both inbound and outbound. Our rule was always focus first on inbound, but be also strict on the qualification part. So if you see like someone signing up where you obviously see there is no opportunity, be strict and say this is unqualified. Yeah, Even if probably something can fall through the cracks, but don't focus on dead horses. Yeah, Because if that continues, you will not, you will not be successful. And then really fast, try to do the rest of your time outbound. And if the company grows, split it into two functions. Yeah, because it's a different skill set and different things to do. here. And I think, Lisa, to answer your question, 50-50 is a, is a um, good split. But I know also really big CRM systems yeah, who promote inbound like hell. Yeah. Uh, and are also focusing on inbound, but they generate most of their business via outbound tactics. Mm. So uh, that's really interesting for me. So it depends also on the industry, on your buyer. Yeah, If your buyer is used to get cold calls, to get approached, outbound will work way better. But if your buyers are not used to get cold calls, to get approached, you have obviously have to start that slower and then marketing is probably the better choice. You know, it's a key word you said is qualified and organizations are usually all over the place. And what I mean by it is sometimes early on, especially if they get a lot of inbound, hey, we have a lead at Sony, but who are we talking to? Is it even someone that can buy from us? Are we even talking to a division that makes sense? So whether it's inbound or outbound, and you're right, outbound, we could be more deliberate about which personas which titles which within which industries should we be targeting because they're the ideal buying persona versus, hey, let's just get a warm body on the phone. And I think sales sometimes gets frustrated with marketing because they get a lot of warm bodies that are willing to maybe talk <laughs> versus I need a warm body that might be a good candidate to buy. And uh, that you know qualification, and I, I've seen, you know I've worked with great startups they got a ton of inbounds and sales says, hey, BDRs, don't get in the way. Just give me all the names. I'll, I'll figure it out. But then as you scale, you kind of go, whoa, whoa, whoa. I really need the BDRs to do some level of qualification. And I get it. You know, These might be people that don't have years and years of experience on the sales side or even the product side. But at a minimum, this is the persona I'm looking for with these types of problems and these types of situations. If you get someone that meets those criteria, I got a qualified lead. And that kind of goes back to the playbooks, right? These 
from our perspective, a version of them needs to be playbooks that go, hey, here's who you should target with these types of problems or in these types of situations with these types of questions. And uh, so, I, hey, I'm kind of go, go full circle. When we talk about Kickstart, we, we talk a lot about like a, a platform. In, in a way, I kind of start feeling, and I, I want your clarification. We might get a little technical here. Is it, is it like, I kind of almost start seeing it like a learning management system in a way, right? Hey, I log into your platform. It knows, um, hey, which playbooks I've already done, which ones I haven't. Is that, give me a little insights into kickstart the platform. Is that kind of how it works? So, Carlos Lisa, imagine really, yeah, you're a sales leader and exactly what you mentioned, the qualification part, inbound, outbound, it has to be recertified every time because there are so many opinions. Everyone has an opinion and you need to check it. So there comes the playbook into place. Imagine you're a sales leader. You take over a new team, you hire new people, whatever, even if you have never done a sales leadership role like I have never done sales leadership before I got my sales leadership position. Um, you need playbooks. And if you don't have these playbooks, you go into the Kickscale platform and take out the templates. You can adopt these templates towards your needs, check what templates fit my organization, my industry, and so on. And with this certain set of playbooks and you hire starts or even the existing ones, you roll this training curriculum and you're absolutely right. Yeah, we talk about educational technology for sales. Yeah, that's what we are. That's what our DNA is um, with that customization part. It's not pure learning only. You get content. That's what you do. You can also customize that content very easily. And as a sales leader, you roll it out. And everyone in the sales department, when they get the invite link towards a Kickscale platform, they have to fill out certain questions to qualify them, like an initial scoring model, a coaching model, if you will. Mm. And then you as a sales leader, you see, hey, this person thinks they are bad in meeting management. You can even then check Salesforce and say, okay, they are really losing deals from whatever, the first meeting towards closing. There is the problem with this salesperson. And that's how this is a really a tool for the sales leader to deliver the right playbooks at the right time for the right salesperson. Good point. And hey, I'm sorry there, it's kick scale, not kick start. My bad, earlier. Um, oh yeah. So in a way, kick scale, the platform becomes kind of like the, um, the, the, you know, the platform for all my um, playbooks, whether they're ones that you already have or they're ones that we customize or they're brand new ones in certain areas like a new hire or an existing employee, I go in there and I can get updates and content continuously. Did I say that right? Totally, Carlos, absolutely. That's exactly the thing. Also playbook updates, like you mentioned. Imagine, Lisa, you mentioned it, I think, earlier. One of the biggest hustles I see out there is CRM and CRM hygiene for the sales team. And mm -hmm. what I have seen also in a lot of sales organizations, it's not the problem that the CRMs are so complex. But the problem is that sometimes, and in most cases, the expectations are just not clear what to do and what to fill in in Salesforce. And so instead of filling something in, people say, hey, okay, I get it. I don't do it. I wait until my sales manager <laughs> screams at me or sends me frustrated emails or the CEO or whoever. And then, okay, I get it now. Yeah, And for, probably forget it until the next quarter already because there was some changes. And this is what these playbooks will do. They will say, hey, this is what changed. You got an update in the CRM. Yeah, You get that in and you train the people again on that. Okay. So let's uh, do a little more geekiness on my side. Are this playbooks, uh, is it, you know, content they read? Are there videos? You know, what format does that take in so a rep can actually absorb them effectively? Built for the new generation, I would say. Yeah. So to be honest, our platform is definitely not built for a really, really sales professional being in the industry for 20, 30, 40 years. Yeah. They still can get a lot of value out of it. Don't get me wrong. 
but it's really built for the new generations of sellers consuming short form content. We have a lot of videos in here. We have short form text in it, really easy to use like TikTok for sales. Yeah, TikTok <laughs> is quite popular also uh, within the sales community. And short form content is the new thing. So we don't produce like a one hour video, yeah, and then say, hey, watch that one hour video. We rather make a playbook, which is probably like you are doing the great podcast, yeah, 20, 30, 35 minutes um, or even longer, depending on the playbook, but really cut into pieces. And okay. then I can roll out the whole playbook or even pieces if I want. And so I make this learning part um, completely different and more attractive. Do you get outside sources, you know, like Elisa of the world or myself to kind of come in and help you with some of that content video, you know, or, or, and do you, and I guess continuing on, can you get your clients to kind of even update some content? Like, hey, here's what we found effectively. Just curious. So I would love to do that. Yeah, like a playbook with with your experience, especially on the on the revenue executive side, um, with all the know how you have. And typically, we go to experts like you and say, hey, what are you really passionate about? Where where is your sweet spot? And we ask them if they want to do a playbook. We obviously check our experts. We see what's their track record, what kind of successes they have. Because we will not build all the playbooks. We are the platform operator. Right now, we build some playbooks, obviously, to um, get our customers a head start. But we have a lot of experts already in. Our customers can choose. And yeah, Carlos, I think the, the end goal is that also customers say, Hey, I have a stellar process on outbound sales. Yeah. I'd like as a person share that. Yeah. If obviously there are no secrets in and the company mm -hmm. is fine with it and so on and so forth. Yeah. And they can upload it to the marketplace and other leaders can use that content as their source of truth to build the same thing. What we learned at Y Combinator copying Algolia, I would love to have back then five, seven years ago. I would love to have a platform which teaches me, hey, step one, do that. This is proven by Algolia. We would be probably two years ahead now of where we are today yeah, with my former companies or with the companies I worked for. Love it. Amazing. Great advice. So we actually do ask uh, guests a couple of questions at the end of every of every interview and uh, as much as we could t carry on all day on these topics um, <laughs> we, we've got to consider the time so i'm curious what would be your number one piece of advice that would help our listeners to achieve their goals this year we call it our acceleration insight so I can talk about my mistake and especially on an executive level as it's sales executive yeah revenue executives um, giving the structure to the team. I think what I really did not estimate that it's so important is the expectations and structures for the team. Like I'm, I'm going out and say, hey, we need to do that and that and I figure my way somehow out, yeah? But giving the structure and the right way how to do it, ideally best practices, that's what I would give every revenue executive on the way yeah and taking really time out for that to build these best practices and share it because i did not take time out of my schedule i was like running oh one quarter one other then a seller quit yeah another seller started i had no formal onboarding uh we had to hit the numbers and i completely overlooked it right and being in as a leader one two three months you then yeah, fully in the in the game, more or less. Yeah, and you have a number to hit and you do everything to hit these numbers. And I think then it gets really stressful for you as a manager, as a revenue executive, because you don't take the time out of building that. And also sometimes pushing back to the board and say, hey, we need to do that. We need to do that to get that, get that going and that we are successful, probably not next week, but ideally already this quarter or next quarter and that every sales leader after me will be also successful with that process. There's a famous American basketball coach, John Wooden, and one of his lines is, uh, if you don't have time to do it right, when do you have time to do it over? So to finish up on a, you yeah. know, a little sports analogy, it kind of goes back to that, right? Sometimes we're yes. running so fast to get it done yes. that we forget we need to get it done right. 
Yeah. And these stories, uh, I read also the um, the CRO leader, yeah, from John McMahon. And these stories are repeating in, in almost every sales organization. Yeah. And this is what you have to take time. I love that statement, Carlos. Yeah. Thanks for, for sharing. Amazing. And I understand, Gerald, that there are some free templates that you offer for people. Where can they find that content? So, yes, there are free templates available. They can go to our website, uh, kickscale.com, and can actually sign up for uh, the free trial and for the freemium version of our product. And then they get certain templates like the ideal customer profile, the value framework, certain things they can really fill out already and can really yeah hit the ball running i love it that's so great um and gerald if anyone wanted to get in touch with you to speak more about the topics we covered today or just to connect with you what's your preferred method of communication so i'm on all channels <laughs> um but ideally to be honest via email yeah um, i like it to read my emails sometimes in between but Email is always best, LinkedIn as well, but on LinkedIn, it's sometimes very hectic. So email is typically the best way to reach me, especially if there is a task associated with something. I have my email as a task and then things get done as well. Okay, great. Well, cannot thank you enough for your time today. It's been so great having you on the show. Thank you as well. Carlos Lisa was a pleasure to be your guest. Thank you for the very, very interesting questions. And looking forward to, yeah, together uh, enabling even more sales and revenue executives with the right playbooks. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. All right, everyone, that does it for this episode of the B2B Revenue Executive Experience. Please check us out at www.b2brevexec.com. Share this episode with your family, your friends, your dogs, your kids. And if you like what you hear, please do us a favor and throw us a five-star review on iTunes. I am Lisa Schneer. My co-host and podcast partner, Carlos Noche, is here with me. And until next time, we wish you nothing but the greatest success. You've been listening to the B2B Revenue Executive Experience. To ensure that you never miss an episode, subscribe to the show on iTunes or your favorite podcast player. Thank you so much for listening. Until next time.